So we are very happy to have Xiao Liang from Stanford, and uh, he will tell us about the horrible information and, and some graph OK, um, thanks, um, um, Matamichi and Hugo and, and Rafael for organizing this uh, uh, workshop. Um, so uh, um, uh, today I will talk about some um, recent work uh, we are doing on level information and ensemble gravity. Um, so th oh, it was working a minute ago. That's strange. I, I was, uh, when I tried it, it was working. Uh, no, I think he checked that I'm not muted. Can you, you can't hear me, right? It's just that the screen, screen somehow is frozen. Oh, OK, it works. Sorry. Yeah, so um, so I will discuss the uh, outline. And basically, we will study this uh, level information in several cases. And um, uh, I will discuss the more um, also the relation with uh, other um, Works um, and this is an uh, ongoing work um, in collaboration with uh, uh, Shang Nan Zhou, <coughs> my student who is here, and then Zhen Bin Yang. And uh, um, by the way, Shang Nan is uh, graduating this year. Yeah, um, this year's <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for reminding everyone. Um, so, um, so the um, the motivation is that um, we know in recent years there is uh, results uh, that uh, suggest that gravity is an ensemble theory, which means that when you try to think about mapping from gravity to quantum mechanics, it may not be a pure, may not be like a geometry corresponding to a state, but maybe an ensemble of states. Um, <coughs> and then, um, so the, the question is, the question I mainly want to talk about is how big is that ensemble? So um, if you, so, so more precisely, if I think about an ensemble gravity, it seems to suggest that, that let's say either in ADS-CFT or ADS-CFT plus bath, um, in that kind of setup, then um, for a given Cauchy surface that defines a state. So uh, usually we think it defines a state. So the question is whether um, that state um, in the bulk defined by the Cauchy surface on the boundary, does that define a family of states, an ensemble of states, or a, or a unique state? Um, so, so, um, so when I say how big is the ensemble, you would want some uh, uh, physical kind of measure. Like you could have an ensemble labeled by arbitrarily large number of parameters. Uh, a simple example is SYK with a J, and the J coupling can take an infinite number of different value, right? But that doesn't mean effectively your ensemble is infinite. It, it could still be, you can only uh, store a finite number of, finite amount of information in that ensemble. And that's exactly um, what we want to describe by, uh, by whole level information. Um, it seems that the computer is just getting very slow. So, so, um, so this uh, whole level information, just uh, briefly, um, it's, um, um, it's measuring, uh, it's, it's defined for a given ensemble of states. So if I have an ensemble of states rho j labeled uh, with probability pj, then um, the question is like, if I have pj and then for, I randomly generate this number pj and then I send you the state rho j if I get a j then how much classical information can I send you? Right? So to the extreme limit is if uh, whatever j corresponds to the same state rho j, I can send zero information to you. If I have every j corresponds to orthogonal states, then um, I could send maximal amount of information. Like if I have 100 classical bits, I can send all of them. So it's something in between. And, uh, and this is the this, uh, amount of classical information you can send can be described by uh, classical mutual information. If you introduce an ancilla state which labels that J and they are defined to be orthogonal, then basically you can define a classical uh, uh, separable state that's uh, describing the correlation between this classical J and the real J. And then you look at the mutual information, it looks like this, and it's, it's, it's simply an uh, entropy of the average state and minus the average of the entropy of each state. Uh, I should point out that um, um, after we thought about these, I, I realized yeah, I should, uh, we should realize earlier that there are, there are these uh, um, related works by uh, Ningbao and collaborators, and, and uh, also this uh, work by Rafael and uh, Elizabeth with the hand. And uh, so, uh, um, so I think we are discussing different things, but uh, they, are they are certainly closely related. Um, you will see. Um, um, 
I think I will discuss, I can discuss more about the relation later. Um, so, okay, so to, uh, to understand how, like, uh, how the Holeva information behaves in this uh, kind of system with holographic deal, let's start with uh, random tensor networks, which are toy models of, hologra of uh, um, states in holographic duality. Um, they, they naturally are ensembles of states. Um, basically, for any given geometry, the, the, the analog of geometry in random tensor network is a, is a discrete graph. And more generally, it doesn't have to be just a graph, which means it corresponds to EPR pairs. More generally, it could be a more generic state, which you can imagine as like, I have EPR pairs that's describing the geometry, but I also have additional quantum fields living in the bulk. So in general, it's a generic state rho p, which is like the state you, you have before you're connecting the tensors. That's a simple state. And then um, connecting the tensors correspond to a projection in that state. So tensor network can be thought as you prepare a bigger state than your physical system, and then project out some unphysical qubits, which correspond to the bulk in the gravity case. And then you are left with a more non-trivially entangled state on the boundary, which satisfies the Takanagi formula. Um, and uh, so, so naturally, the different choice of random tensors gives you an ensemble. So if I take the same row P and then project it on different random states, that's, a, that's an ensemble. And the, this ensemble has the property that each, um, each member of this ensemble has the same entangled property, entanglement property. Each of them in the large bound dimension limit, uh, when uh, these entropies self-average, they all look the same in terms of RT formula. They all, they all correspond to like, um, the same graph geometry. Um, but, but they are very different states. If you calculate their overlap, it's very small. So it's just like a, a generalization of random states, which have very small overlap, but they all have very similar entanglement property. Um, so more precisely, um, we can um, actually, instead of saying it's, I'm taking that state and projecting on a random tensor, we can, we can do this in you know, a more um, physical way. We can think of the projection as a consequence of measurement. So this is very similar to what you heard from Greg from the previous talk. So you think uh, like physically, I have this uh, bigger Hilbert space rho p. So, so let's take the single tensor example where, where this, uh, I'm just considering there is only one bulk vertex and I'm applying that one measurement uh, uh, on b. So it's like I have a system with a, b, c, three qubits, and then I apply a measurement on b, which is fully, uh, uh, which is a projector with rank one. So you, after the measurement, you know the state of B completely. So then you um, look at uh, that uh, re remaining state of AC. Uh, so you get a state of AC, and the remaining state of AC depends on, uh, depends on the, the, the measurement. And then we are interested in the case where these measurements are not uh, orthogonal projectors, but POVMs. So uh, why, why do we need that? Because we want, uh, in random tensors, we want uh, uh, this, uh, projecting state Vj to be uh, forming a, a K design, a state K design. Because it's not sufficient that they are orthogonal states because you want to do this projection on, on, on the state and then um, averaging over the measurement results is equivalent to like averaging over all higher random unitaries acting on this uh, state. So that, that's the requirement. So I'm always considering like this number of states M is very big, much bigger than dB. And then uh, they form the K design, where I will consider the K to be large enough for my purpose. Like I, I'm, a, uh, I'm interested in the case where K is uh, sufficiently large. So, I, I, so basically, for any purpose uh, we have, it's the same as you just choosing random states V, and then um, averaging over random states. Um, so then. Um, we have this uh, familiar story that was. Uh, uh, in the original random tensor network paper uh, we had in 2016, where when you average over the random tensor, you get a, a, um, a sum over permutations. And that, uh, um, that allows us to calculate um, the entropy quantities. Um, but so, so this is a little different from our original um, calculation, because here I assigned a probability for each uh, uh, measurement result. So like, when we think about random tensor networks uh, uh, as just a, a way to describe states, we, what, we should, what we should do is normalize every state and then average over the choice of random tensor. Here, 
here, uh, every state comes with a probability, which is just the ordinary like measurement of probability, uh, the probability that comes in this uh, uh, measurement. So once you do that, then the consequence is that um, the average state is exactly the state before the projection. Right? You, 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 take the, you take the projector, the POVM, and then the POVM condition just tells you that um, if you average over that uh, measurement result, which means like you, you measure the result and you don't look like it, then the trace, trace over it is equivalent to um, just the original state. So like if I'm interested in the region A, then the entropy of A in the average state is just the entropy of A in the original state without projection, the original state with ABC and trace over B and C. So that part is um, clear. And then the second part is what we need to compute. Um, before I, move, I continue, is there any questions about the definition of this ensemble? So J, J is the measurement output. And if you trace it out, then you're losing that information. Well, that's the first term in the whole level information. The first term is you take your state rho J, average over J, with that probability. Yeah, okay. The second term is you calculate the entropy of each state and average it over PJ. Okay, so the second term is where I'm going to be able to pass a message. Yeah. Or something. So in the measurement uh, induced phase transition case, you talk about it. I think uh, the same quantity is defined. Yeah. Right? You do measurements, and then there's this measurement output. We can study the entropy. Probably in your case, this second term is more interesting. But basically, in, in, all, these, uh, in all such cases, yeah, the average state is always the state uh, like before, you, before you do the measurement, yeah, and sense. then you do the partial trace. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Yes. So, so you, you, you make a random tensor network by just making local measurements. And you, you give me the tensor network, but you don't give me J. I, I give you a sub, subsystem A of the tensor network. And then you ask me to get J, and yeah. that is uh, the new tensor network. That's the whole level information, yes. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's uh, yeah. So the setup here is that it's like I, I generated this ensemble of states. Each of them looks, uh, each of them seems to have the same entanglement property. And then, uh, and then I give you that subsystem uh, density metric rho a, and see how much you can figure out whether, uh, I, uh, yeah, how much do you know about these uh, measurement results? J. You are measuring in a quite uh, uh, random uh, uh, over uh, uh, POVM. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, the, but the parameter J here is not different states you fit in the bulk. Yeah, it's a different right. mapping from bulk to boundary. Right. Yeah. So, so if that's the case, so, so that's basically, that's the randomness in the tensor network, right? Yes, yes. Um, so think about, think for about, uh, for a, yeah. For a, suppose that I have a bulk state of a bunch of particles, right? Um, and, and, I, and I want to map that to a boundary state. That's an interesting thing. So actually, there are because if you think about the example of uh, SYK model, um, yeah, na naively. Sorry, but the SYK model is different because it's, it's manifest with an ensemble. So maybe that's the point. But at the same yeah, standard ACFD, it's yeah. not. We wouldn't want to average over anything, right? That's exactly yeah. That's a that's a one point I want to emphasize. So here. I think uh, not, it's not like an ensemble because there is something in behind the horizon, some different macro states. It's really the whole, um, uh, the whole space is giving you this kind of ensemble average. Like even if I have an ADS vacuum, the ensemble is non-trivial. And the example is like SYK. It's like, like SYK with different J um, is an example where for every J, you get almost the same correlation functions for simple operators. And then you have, as Rafael said, you have like, like if you take the SYK and then you take an operator in the bulk, um, and then you can do something like HKL and reconstruct it to the boundary. So it seems like there is no um, 
there is no randomness, right? It's like naively, it seems like the mapping from buff operator to boundary operator has no randomness in it. But that, but because the, that, that mapping involves Heisenberger operators on the boundary, it actually already knows about the Hamiltonian, where the randomness comes in. So I think the picture that both the SYK example and the random tensor network example suggest is that um, with the same bulk physics, you can map it to different than different boundary physics with different boundary Hamiltonians, which share the same entanglement property. So we don't really understand the bulk physics very well for a single instance of, I mean, for a single member of the SYK. Well, we know the simple correlation functions. They should self-average. That's what we know. I mean, maybe there's some, uh, like, other n lengths of operators that can do something more than trivial, uh, that can depend on j. But the simple, like, as long as you take an operator with other one number of fermions, the correlation function is independent from, uh, from j. The replica diagonal property gives us that. So that is uh, this uh, scanning of random entropy. It's essentially fixing uh, entanglement entropy. It forms almost a space in the large degree of freedom field. It's the same mechanism as the area operator meets an operator. Despite the fact that the entanglement entropy is basic dependent, you have an effective space. Uh, if you just scan this random tensor, would that almost span the entire that part space of the increase degree A? Or you, you fix the entanglement entropy, and then you have almost the space. You have exponentially rare exception, of course. I, I believe that's true, but I don't know how you prove that. Clear, yeah. But, but you can believe that that's, that's I believe that's the case. I don't know how you, Maybe. like, like if you give me all like subsystem entropy of all subsystems and say what can I use random tensor network to describe all of them, I would guess yes, but I don't know how to but prove it. Yeah, I mean what we know how to prove is like like if you give me all tensor networks on all geometries, we have a proof that that's uh, over complete basis yeah. that can be used to expand any state. That you can prove, but yeah. Um, so these projections, um, they are they are kind of the toy version of uh, geometrical fluctuations. So they happen whenever you allow geometry to be to be dynamical. So it's everywhere in the bulk. Yeah. So this picture, like uh, A, B, C, you should think like A, C together is the boundary, and B is like the bulk. And or in the evaporating black hole, A, C will be boundary plus the bulk. Boundary together with the band, yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so in a simple example where if you take row P to be just EPR pairs like this, let's say row P has EPR pair between A and B1, and then EPR pair between C and B2. That's what we usually think as a tensor network, right? If you have a tensor network with one tensor and two legs, that's, that's what it means. But what I wrote earlier is like a more general formula. So then um, you have, um, like if you take a random tensor and then do this calculation, then then you know the Rutalinagi formula of the entropy will be you cut the network either here or there, right? So depending on which leg is is lower dimensional, then if uh, if the BC pair has a lower lower dimension, then the entropy will be given by this one. But the average state is the state is the state before projection, which is just these two EPR pairs. So if you trace over B and C, the average state always have the entropy that's the, that's the dimension of A. Okay. So, so in the average state, the entropy of A is always maximum. So this is just showing that the whole level information is non-trivial if the actual entropy of A for, for the projected state is given by the thinner line, then there is a non-trivial whole level information. And so this is, uh, that's just a, a very simple example. Um, but then more generally, uh, we can, we can, well, this is a, uh, I think this comment is not so important for the current calculation because we need to think about the large deep tensor networks. So uh, all the quantities self-average, I'm just using, uh, I'm just going to use the real formula, as, which it comes from the large D limit of random tensor network. But, uh, but as a side effect, we do find that it seems uh, like the, if, I, if I'm calculating this average entropy, the second term of the, or level information. If I look at this average entropy, um, um, it seems I only need this one parameter n and do a replica limit. That, that seems to be 
simpler than what Greg was showing. Well, I, I'm interested in see how that, uh, like, like whether <laughs> there's some problem here. But it seems like, uh, like if I like the project probability here is given by that measurement, and the state is the, the state you get by the measurement. In that particular combination, we can find a replica uh, trick where this quantity is like the separate average. It's like you, without doing normalization, you, you average the trace row to the n. And then the denominator is like the trace row to the n. And then so you separately average over them, take a ratio, and then take n to be going to 1. That seems to give you this uh, average entropy. OK, so anyway, so the point is that in the limit where you have a, a lot of uh, EPR pairs, then, uh, then the, the second term basically self-averages. Like for each, for each choice of J, this uh, entropy is almost the same. It's given by the real time IE formula. And then, um, so in that case, you get, in summary, you get this formula, which says that the whole level information in this ensemble is equal to the entropy contribution uh, without the entanglement wedge minus the ordinary one, which generically has the entanglement wedge. So what does that mean? If you have a tensor network like this, then um, you do this uh, entropy calculation in the large bound dimension limit. It's dominated by a configuration. Uh, it becomes a spin model calculation where there is a boundary condition. Let's say for a second rainy, it's like an icing model with spin down here and spin up here. And then in the box, spin could be up or down. So the dominant configuration is like the blue dots are down and the, the black dots are up. So that's giving you the second term. And the first term, because you trace over the whole bulk, so that translates to everywhere spin must be up. So in this simple picture, it just means the entropy of A is maximum. And, but more generally, if these are not just EPR pairs, but there are some other states, it could, could be not, not maximum. But in general, the rule is there is no entanglement wedge. So you take the contribution of the optimal entanglement wedge and the contribution with no entanglement wedge. The difference is the whole level information. And the one interesting comment that may be interesting in, uh, uh, in quantum information point of view is that in that case, the, the entropy with no internal wedge is just the entropy of A in the original state before projection. But the entropy with internal wedge is just the entropy in the original state of a bigger region, which is A plus its internal wedge. So the whole level information actually is exactly minus the conditional entropy of uh, sigma A with A. So it's like, it's, that's something that tells you like it must be some measure of quantum entanglement between entanglement wedge and the boundary state in the original state. If there is no quantum entanglement, the conditional entropy is, is positive, and then you'll never have this non-trivial Hawaii information. So uh, that's just, so, so there is, in this limit of large bound dimension tensor networks, there is a relation between Hawaii information and the conditional entropy. Um, OK, so, so now, based on this result, it's natural to conjecture that, in general, when we take an ADS-CFT system or ADS-CFT plus bath, then the same thing happens, that you can take two. Uh, you, the whole level information is a difference of two terms. The first term is the solution without the internal wedge. The second one is the, one, the ordinary RT uh, or HRT entropy uh, given by the quantum extremal surface. So in particular, if I consider evaporating black hole, the first term is the Hawking entropy, which means because, because if you require there is no entanglement wedge for A, like now in, in that case, I'm considering A to be a part of the Hawking radiation. Let's say I have a late, I have a black hole after page time, and I have a, a region A that's big enough, there is an island, then, then, uh, then this, uh, uh, if, you, if you look at all different geometry, and, and you are looking for the solution that corresponds to no entanglement wedge, that just means that you are looking at the sector that the trivial cytopoint point um, without the replica wormhole. So, so this average state entropy um, is given by, by the solution with trivial cytopoint, point, uh, which is the Hawking entropy, and then the, the, the other term is the, is the quantum extremal surface result, which has an non-trivial island. So, so this average state entropy was already calculated in this work of, uh, of Raphael and Elizabeth. And uh, um, so um, I think, so, so for this system, really the only thing I'm, uh, I'm saying here is just pointing out that this difference is a, a collateral information. It's measuring, um, the, I'm measuring how much you know about the black hole geometry. If you, sorry, how much you know about these hidden parameters in an ensemble. 
um, um, which is like an ensemble of many states which share the same geometry. So then there is some subtlety that if you make this conjecture without the ADS, without the bath, it's a little more, uh, it's not uh, as well defined because if you don't have the bath, then if A is a subsystem of the boundary, then, then naively I would uh, say the first term is like the maximal entropy of A, um, but uh, that's UV divergent. So as you will see, that seems to be confirmed by our SYK calculation. Um, um, but so like whether it's something defined, uh, like is there a way to regularize it? And in the EDSCFT case, I think it is uh, uh, not entirely clear. Um, any questions? Well, it, when we think of the tensor network as a consequence of preparing a bigger state and do the measurements, then yeah, you are right. So the, the whole level information depends on what measurement you do. And these results are only true if these measurements are done in a basis that's random enough in the sense of it's from the K design of states. Um, so, so, so for the same reason, like, like RT formula will depend on this measurement basis. It will require these measurements to be on random enough states uh, in order for the, uh, for, for the RT formula to be true. So it's depend on the random bas basis in the same way as, as RT formulas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I saw that, yeah. How, how do I, well, will he just speak? I uh, Ning, I don't think I can hear you, can you? Okay. Okay, you can okay, you speak. Can speak. Oh, no. No, no, no. no. I, I think it's uh, maybe a problem in his side. I, I, I turned on. I turn on the, maybe I, I mute and you turn on your voice there. Yeah. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, okay, so my question was, uh, it's interesting to me that you can write the whole label information as that conditional information. Is it obvious that the sign of that conditional information is uh, definite because the whole label information is always on menu? Uh, yeah, so the so what happened is if that sign, if the conditional entropy is uh, positive, then uh, you have no entanglement wedge. So the 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 whole level information is zero. So I mean, when you have a, a non-trivial entanglement wedge, that's when 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 that that gain gain you that that reduces the entropy. Like having including sigma has to in, in reduce the entropy. So so by the way, these uh, these entropies. Uh, it's frozen again. Uh, by the way, these, these entropies um, I written here, they all correspond to the generalized entropy in the gravitational case, which include the area Shane, lock. Could you unmute yourself? I don't hear you anymore. Oh. Uh, did, so, sorry, there is one computer which we can hear from you, and there is another computer you can hear from me. <laughs> uh, so did you, did you hear anything I said earlier? Um, when, when I, or so I start, start from answering Ning's uh -huh. question? No, I think they can hear me, right? Oh. Is Ning speaking? Oh, gosh. <laughs> sorry, let me, let, me, let me study this. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Well, let, me, let me see some speaker problem. So, um, it's some speaker problem. Um, no, sorry. Microphone speaker. Um, can you, Ning? Can you talk again? Let's see if I can hear you. No, I didn't hear Ning. Um, or anyone can, can anyone try to talk? I want to see if I can hear you. I just switched the speaker. No, but nobody is talking. Maybe can you uh, turn on? Your is Douglas talking? Uh, speaker. I turn on this. 
it's just um, can anyone can, hello yeah I can hear from here but, uh, is, that, is, is someone talking but can I, does, I can just talk from here right? yeah but is your Mac? Yeah, oh. I'm, yeah. I unmuted. So. Okay, so um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. So, so, so my answer to Ning's question is that the conditional entropy has to be negative in order for us, uh, for the entanglement wedge to be non-trivial. So, if the if the conditional entropy of any subsystem sigma um, in the bulk with A is positive, if they are all positive, then then the best uh, the quantum extremal surface is the blue line in the picture, which means there is no internal wedge. Um, okay. Um, should I continue? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's look at uh, some other example of a SYK model. I will be quick, um, maybe in five minutes. Um, so, um, yeah, so the other example, <sighs> sorry, it's not showing. Um, um, so the other example is a SYK model. And um, when you take a SYK model, look at the, let, let's, let's, we will look at two, two cases. The first case is the thermal state. So look at the thermal state, uh, then it depends on the random parameter J. Um, so this is another example of an ensemble of states which share the same simple correlation functions. Right? So we know like uh, the SYK correlation function or partition function calculation is rapidly got diagonal. There is some one over n uh, power suppression uh, for higher, um, for, high, for um, for um, um, J for fluctuations uh, in J, uh, so 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 basically this uh, if in terms of simple correlators, this uh, ensemble is self-averaging. So so the second term in Hollywood information is simple because it's self-averaging is just the thermal entropy. So for every J, it's a thermal entropy. So the average is still the thermal entropy as a function of beta, or as a function of beta J, beta and the, and the amplitude of J. Um, and then the average state in this case is also very easy to calculate because the symmetry, because you are averaging over all possible random J's which are independent Gaussian variables. This averaging itself has a very symmetric measure. So you can show, you can prove that this row beta of A basically have to commute with all the fermion operators. And as a consequence, there has to be identity. Um, because when you, when, you, when you conjugate the row with a chi, you're just changing sign of some J's. You're changing sign of all the terms that involve chi I and that doesn't change the pj. Right? So, so you can prove that rho beta has to be identity and therefore the entropy is maximum. So that seems to be consistent with our gravitational conjecture that now you are only available, you, you, you are only given the state on the right side, which is the thermal state. And then um, the Rutaganagi entropy will be this uh, thermal entropy given by this extremal surface. And then the no internal wedge will be correspond to the maximum entropy of the system. Um, then there is a slightly more non-trivial case for SYK is what if I give you not the one side, which is the thermal state, but I give you both sides. I give you a thermal field double state itself. Then, um, then, then the difference from the previous case, well, the, the entropy of every state will be zero, but the non-trivial task is to compute the, the entropy of the average state. So the average state, um, now you do the symmetry analysis again, the average state now, it could be more than trivial. It doesn't have to be identity because there is only one joint uh, symmetry. Right? So there is an SON symmetry. Like you, need to, you, can rotate the SO, you can do an SON rotation of chi IL, but you, need, you have to do the same rotation for chi IR. Um, well, if you do both, then the J will be just rotated and the probability is uniform. So um, the probability is invariant under, unitary, under the orthogonal rotations. So you get the conclusion that that your average state is uh, always just a function of the SON environment operators. There is three SON environment operators, which is the fermion parity of the left side, the fermion parity of the right side, and, uh, and this, uh, this, this thing, this bilinear coupling. Um, so 
uh, in general, I think it's an interesting question to study this for finite n, where maybe all three will, generally all three will show up. So you, you'll get some non-trivial uh, density operator. Um, but in large n, because all the correlation functions of equal, uh, what I mean is equal time correlation functions with all their one number of fermions, it should uh, satisfy weak theorem. So, um, so rho a uh, is uh, approximately Gaussian. So up to some one-on-one -one corrections, it's Gaussian state, so we can conjecture that it will, well, if it's Gaussian state, it will look like this. And then this only parameter lambda is, is determined by two-point function. So basically, you take this uh, two-point function between left and right, which is just the, the halfway um, thermal correlator in the Euclidean circle. And that, that, that thing is between 0 and 1, and that determines your parameter lambda. So, so you put that in, and you calculate the whole level information. It's simply n decoupled qubits is n times that, that entropy of probability p, where the p is, uh, is uh, 1 minus g yeah, over 2. So that's, uh, yeah, so I think that's, so that result is a little different from naive expectation, which will be like just the maximal entropy. But I think that's because the SYK has a large number of bulk quantum fields. So, so the entropy is not just given by area term. So it's, it's, uh, um, it's like if you think about no internal wedge as a limit of a very small internal wedge, you take a very small ribbon on the boundary and take that to be going to zero, then that contribution is non-trivial because there is a non-trivial correlation between left and right. And that correlation is order n, not order one, because you have all the fermions, all the n number of fermions which are entangled with each other. So basically, if you take that limit, then you get this entropy in the previous slide. Um, so yeah, in summary, that's, uh, so we have this conjecture and uh, um, it seems to be pretty well defined in the case of evaporating black hole, but um, in ADS-CFT where you have this UV divergence problem, I'm not sure. So one, one interesting question is whether it's possible to define some more refined measure because um, in random tensor network, it's totally meaningful to only average over some parameters in a given region rather than everywhere. Then you will get a, re, re, you get like a, a rule about excluding entanglement wedges. Basically, you, you can look at all different uh, set of point surfaces, and then uh, if the actual RT surface lives in that region, you remove it, and then you find some other surface, like this picture. You find some other surface which, uh, which it doesn't touch that region. Uh, then that may give you a bigger entropy. So the difference is like the information in the parameter in that region. But in the gravitational case, um, naively, yeah, when we have multiple saddle points, we could say, yeah, that's the meaning of uh, parameters in that region. But I don't, uh, I don't really know um, more precisely what that means. Okay, thank you.